Welcome to Solo Kittles Podcast, episode 40-something, I think. Um, I've been at this for almost a year now, which is really hard to believe. So today I'm joined by an author, which I haven't had an author in a little while, so it's a little something different. He wrote, I know he wrote a Lennon book, but I can't remember the name. It is called John Lennon, Life is What Happens. And that came out in 2010. Yeah. And he's the author of the newish The Beatles 100. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to be here, Hudson. Thanks for having me. Anytime. Um, and so I want to go back to the very beginning. Um, how did the Beatles? When did you first kind of get the bug, quote unquote? Oh, gosh. I was probably about five or six years old. And my dad bought me a 45, Beatles 45 of All You Need Is Love and Baby You're a Rich Man. Back in, uh, he probably bought it for me in 68, even though it came out in 67. And I just played that thing um, over and over and over and over. And then uh, right around 1970 or so, I started uh, collecting Beatle records on my own. I remember going to a store called Kmart, which I don't even know if there's any more of those left, but. The one closed probably oh. two years ago here. Maybe. Oh, okay. Well, I, I went to a Kmart by where I grew up and bought the, uh, uh, bought the 45 of uh, John Lennon's Instant Karma with the picture sleeve for 63 cents. And I remember that because I still have the picture sleeve. And the price tag was impossible to take off, so it's it's still on there. So um, I, I caught the bug, as you say, pretty early. I've been a Beatles fan since I was uh, under the age of ten, which is hard to believe because that was a long time ago. Well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> it was a, I, I guess it was a long time ago. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I wasn't there at the beginning. I, I was too young. I was born in 1961. Um, so I wasn't there for the Beatlemania aspect of it. I wasn't really there for this, for the actual, um, you know, for what, when, uh, when the Beatles were actually together as a band. I was sort of too young for that, too young to understand what was going on. But uh, I sort of started following them really closely as I got a little older, as I got into my teenage years and sort of work backwards um, from the solo albums uh, back into the Beatle albums and had, you know, pretty much everything by the time I was about your age, honestly. Wow. So if you're born in 61, so that would have been 76 when you kind of got everything. Yeah, I mean, I remember buying the uh, Wings Over America album and wearing that thing out when it was, I think it was in my freshman year in high school. And, um, just loved it and uh you know i always loved the uh ram album that's my favorite hence the shirt that i'm wearing um my my favorite Beatles solo record ever actually out of all of them is is ram um but yeah i've been uh i've been a Beatles nut for a long time been writing about them uh since around the mid 80s i started as a um contributor to goldmine magazine which is a record collector's publication and now i still write for them both for their magazine and online, and I'm a, now a contributing editor. Wow. Um, and uh, did you see the Wings Over America tour? I did not. I, for some reason, did not start going to concerts until I got into college. Um, so I never saw any of the uh, any of the solo Beatles shows until. Uh, let's say I saw Paul um, when he toured uh, in 1990 here in uh, Orange County, California, which is where I'm based. I saw him play at Anaheim Stadium, which is what it was called then, where the Angels play baseball, uh, California Angels. And, um, but yeah, that was the first uh, solo McCartney show I saw. It was when he was touring to promote Flowers in the Dirt. And then I think I've seen him six times since then. Uh, and I've seen Ringo a couple of times also. I have to ask, what is your favorite Beatles album? My favorite Beatles album? Wow. Uh, 
that's a tough one, but I always go back to the UK version of A Hard Day's Night. Uh, I think that's really where they, where the early Beatles kind of hit their stride. Uh, there's no covers on it, it's all originals. Everything on it's great. And as I, I mentioned in the new book, it's very nearly a John Lennon solo record. I think he wrote, uh, either wrote or, or mainly wrote 10 out of the 13 tracks on there. Um, and just everything on there is is wonderful. So that's uh, that might be my favorite one. Although the White Album would be pretty close. I agree. There, the UK Hard Day's Night is severely underrated. It really sort of captures the spirit of the early uh, the early Beatlemania years and the songwriting on there. When you consider the the tracks that were sort of you know, not the more well-known ones, even those are, are great tracks like Anytime at All or Things We Said Today. You know, those weren't singles here in the United States, but great songs, uh, top to bottom. Uh, the entire album is just wonderful. Now going to the book. So, like, your career as a journal, kind of a music journalist, how did that, like, start? Like, when was that, like, oh, this is what I want to do? Well, I've been a music fan since I was very young, uh, Beatles and otherwise. Uh, I used to go to, well, out here they call them swap meets. In most places they call them flea markets. But my, my parents were in the, in, the, uh, in the swap meet business. So they would go out uh, every Sunday to a local drive-in theater and they would load up a bunch of merchandise and sell it. It was kind of a side, side gig for them. And I remember at this um, at this swap meet, there was a, a guy who sold 45s. This would have been probably the mid 70s. Um, he sold 45s and he had the billboard top 100 laid out from one to 100 on this huge table. And I would go there um, every week and just buy you know, whatever was new. If there was a solo Beatles record, if there was a Beatles reissue, uh, 45 that had come out, like a few of those came out in the mid 70s. I would pick those up. Pretty much anything that tickled my fancy that was in the top 40, I would I would pick those up there. Uh, that started my fascination with music, and then I always I've always loved to write, and so then I just decided to combine the uh, the two things. And in the mid 80s, I was a, a subscriber to Goldmine Magazine, and I just decided to write the uh, editor of the magazine at the time a letter saying, I'd love to write for your magazine. I, I love music. I love what you guys do. Uh, and I'm, I love to write. So how do I write for your magazine? This, of course, this is back before email. So I had to actually write a letter <laughs> with a pen and put it on paper. And What's pen and what's paper? I, I know. It, it's an old school thing. You wouldn't understand. Uh, <laughs> so I... Um, uh, sent him this letter, and then he responded and said, well, send me some writing samples. And I didn't have any. You know, I had never written any music reviews before, so I wrote a bunch of uh, mock music reviews, album reviews, and sent them to him. And that's how I got started. That would have been 1986, writing for Goldmine. So it's been, what, what was that, 35 years now that I've been doing this? Uh, freelance for Goldmine and also for a lot of other publications as well. So that's how I got started, just taking the initiative, decided it was something I wanted to do as a music lover, and then um, kind of, well, sort of got my foot in the door and pushed the door open a little bit by asking, and that's how it happened. When you, um, do you remember the first piece you wrote for Goldmine? Oh, the first piece I wrote, you know, I really don't. Uh, I wish I would have kept it. Uh, and it might still be out in my garage somewhere, but I, I really don't remember. Back back then, I used to do a lot of um, what's known as, as power pop, uh, which, of course, the, the Beatles were one of the uh, forefathers of. Uh, it was music that, you know, was it sort of owed a debt to the Beatles, the Birds, the Who, Beach Boys, that sort of 60s stuff. Um, so it, it might have been something along those lines, uh, might have been uh, some obscure group that no one else wanted to write about that I took the assignment for. Um, later on, I started getting into reviewing more Beatles and Beatles. Uh, 
uh, things for Goldmine, uh, both in print and on their website. So I've got a ton of stuff up there now. If you go to goldminemag.com and, and type in my name, you'll find a lot of Beatles things up there that I've written, you know, top 10 McCartney songs and top 10 Lennon songs and, you know, my favorite solo Beatles tunes and everything. So, um, yeah, I've, I've been doing it for a while. Every little thing. I'm sorry? Every little thing you can find on Facebook. Every little thing, yes, yes. <laughs> I, I had to throw a pun in there somewhere. I, I, I love puns. So if you want Beatle puns, uh, I've got a feeling we're going to have a good time here, Hudson. There you go. Ah, uh, well, I don't want to spoil the party. And pardon me while I close this door here because my dog is barking. I don't want uh, don't want the uh, sorry, don't want the dog to ruin our chat. Anyway, oh. when did the um, so how when did the spike come up for the? Uh... I'm sorry, I can barely hear you, Hudson. When did the spike come up for the Beatles 100? Uh, when, when, uh, when was the book released, you mean? When did it, like, when did the idea? Oh, the idea. Well, I've always, um, I've always liked lists, uh, making lists of, of favorites. Uh, one of my previous books is called um, Shake Some Action, A Guide to the 200 Greatest Power Pop Albums. And, you know, I like making lists and I think people like to read them because it's something that's fun. It's something people can agree with or disagree with. Um, you know, everyone has their own opinion of, of what's what, you know, whether it's good or bad, should this be higher than this or this be higher than this or, or whatever. So I thought, you know, it's something that's never really been, been done. And there've been so many Beatles books, obviously, as you know, that have covered the story over and over. I didn't want to write, you know, just, um, a, a biography or something like that that's been done so I thought well how can I um how can I approach this from a little bit of a different angle have a little bit of fun with it and that's what I decided to do is kind of rank the Beatles top 100 moments uh as a group and solo in order of what I feel their importance is from one to 100. And I think you did it really well. Oh thank you. What, what, what's the pro what was the prof like what year did you say that kind of sprung into your mind oh gosh well i you know i always like to have some kind of book project going and i finished the uh i finished the, the shake some action 2.0 is actually my, my second power pop book i finished that in i think that was released in 2017 or 18 um so i i had this idea around for a while it actually began life as a, um, a Paul McCartney book. Um, going back to 2010, you had mentioned my uh, book called John Lennon, Life is What Happens. Um, I had written that at the request of the publishers of Goldmine Magazine. Um, the same publisher released the Lennon book. So after that came out, and I, I guess it did pretty well, they wanted me to write a McCartney one. Uh, and then the ownership of the company changed and whatnot. So I was about halfway through that book. And then they ended up um, terminating the contract that I had to write that book. Oh, wow. And so then I thought, well, I've got this material, but I don't know if I want to write a McCartney book. So, you know, once I finished the Power Pop book, as I said, 2017, 18, I went searching for a new publisher and kind of hit upon this list idea at that time. So I was about to repurpose some of the material that was going to go into the McCartney book and use it for the Beatles 100. So it was kind of a process over, you know, several years. And did the pandemic kind of give you more time to work on it? No, actually, this was uh, this was finished really before the pandemic started. Uh, oh, wow. And that's the process of getting it getting it published, getting the photos, you know, getting everything uh, edited and having copy editors look at it and me look at what the copy editors did and, and that whole process. So uh, I don't remember when it was completed, but it was before the pandemic began. But then we had to, like I said, uh, acquire some of the photos and 
decide which we were going to use. The publisher gave me a uh, this huge bank of photos to look at online. I think it was something, I don't know, something like 5,000 different photos and, and said, you know, pick 20. So I, I had to go through this, this huge, uh, this huge collection of photos and decide which ones I, I wanted to use. So uh, that took a little bit of time. Some of the photos in the book are from uh, online sources that were acquired for the book and some of the materials from my personal collection as well. Did you conduct any interviews while writing the book? I'm like, sorry? Did you do any like interviews with beetle related people? Like, well, you know, I, I spoke to some folks. Um, I had spoken to a couple of people who had worked on John Lennon's double fantasy album. Um, I had spoken to some other people um, who had worked on Beatles records. For example, I interviewed Alan Parsons, um, producer and engineer who worked with uh, the Beatles on the Let It Be sessions, and then also worked um, with McCartney on some of his solo stuff. So there were some interviews that I that I did, um, but most of the book is my opinion or you know quotes that I had either gathered from years of interviewing folks for Goldmine and other outlets or quotes I had found online. And I tried not to go for the obvious ones that are overused all the time that you always see online. Um, and a lot of things that you see online, <laughs> I'm sure you know quotes uh, that end up online you know, the people never even said them, but no. they're attributed to, uh, you know, like, for example, the quote where everyone says, uh, John Lennon supposedly said, um, Ringo's not even the best drummer in the Beatles. Well, John never said that. Yeah. That, but so many people think that he did because so many people still attribute that to him, but it was some British comedian who said it, I think in the 80s or 90s, I don't remember. Yeah, that British comedian. Don't joke around about that. <laughs> yep. Yep. No, Ringo's, well, that's a whole other topic. I, I could go on for hours about Ringo being a drummer myself. Um, Ringo's amazing. You know, everyone thinks the, uh, everyone thinks he was somehow, not everyone, but a lot of folks who aren't really in the know uh, think that he was somehow a lesser musician than uh, John, Paul, or George, but I always say, if you think Ringo wasn't a good drummer, try to play some of the stuff that Ringo plays. Exactly. The way that he played it. It sounds simple, but it's not. And that's the mark of a, of a great drummer who can make something difficult sound simple. Ringo just sort of had that swing. And, um, you know, nothing sounds the same. You know, there's not a lot of songs where, oh, that drum track sounds like that drum track on another song. Or that drum fill sounds just like the fill on that song. It's almost, everything is almost, I don't know, of, of its own piece. It's almost all different. And it's just, it's amazing, amazing drummer, still is. I agree. And I have to ask about your drumming career because you are in a cover band of the Beatles called Let It Be. Mm -hmm. The whole drumming gig start. Well, I've been drumming since I was eight. Um, I mentioned this uh, the swap meet earlier. I used to uh, I used to walk around with my dad at the swap meet, and I've always liked percussion for whatever reason. So I used to walk around with them, banging on my chest and banging on my stomach, and and you know, and finally he said, "You're embarrassing the hell out of me. I'm going to buy you a drum set." So at the swap meet one day, we saw this Ludwig drum set, which I wish I still had, and he bought that for me when I was eight. I taught myself how to play and um, just played in my garage along to Beatles records and whatever else was on the radio at the time. And then when I got married, when I was about 25, moved into an apartment. It's tough to have a drum kit in an apartment, it sort of annoys the neighbors. So sold the drum kit, didn't play again for 15 years. And then when I turned 40, um, started playing again. And, you know, been in a lot of bands and done a lot of recording. Right now, I think I'm in five different bands. But um, the one that plays around the most now is, as you mentioned, uh, Let It Be, Beatles cover band. We play in and around L.A. and Orange County. And it's just a blast, you know, going out, playing those songs. It, it never gets old. And just seeing people's reactions to hearing Beatles songs, whether they're 
you know, eight years old or 80 years old. They know the words, they'll get up and dance, they'll tell you what the songs mean to them. And, you know, that's, as a musician, that's, that's a pretty cool thing. You know, it's nice to see people enjoying music. Um, I also play another cover band uh, called The Test Pressings. We do mainly uh, 70s uh, era covers. Um, we've recorded a couple of things. We just recorded a version of Love Grows Where My Rosemary Goes, uh, which is a hit in 1970 for Edison Lighthouse. Uh, for a tribute album I'm putting together um, for Spider Pop Records out of Texas, uh, it's a tribute to the year 1970. So that track will be going on that CD coming out uh, later this year. And then I play in a band uh, where we do all originals called the Armoires, and I play in a punk band that uh, every, everyone else is based in Texas, but I'm here in California. So we record and then we play a couple times a year. Uh, we're called the Used Electric. So I just go out and do it and have fun. You know, it's, that's what it's all about. Music is all about having fun and, and feeling good, whether you're writing about it or playing it or listening to it or, you know, hosting a show like you do. It's all about having fun and feeling good. And I have to ask you, um, how diehard of a collector are you? Are you like George Harrison Uberbox collector? No, I'm not one of those crazy people you read about online. Who, you know, I, uh, um, I would never spend, you know, tons and tons of money on something. You know, I have, I have a family and a house payment and, um, <laughs> you know, children and, and uh, responsibilities. So I'm not going to, you know, I, and I'm not rich. But uh, if I see something that's cool, that's at a reasonable price, or if I see something that catches my eye, you know, like, I don't know how many Beatles t-shirts I have. Oh my God, I must have like 200 different Beatles and solo Beatles t-shirts. But, you know, I've got, I've got a butcher cover, um, which is something I've always wanted to own. Um, found that really, really cheap, actually, about five years ago when our band was on tour, uh, the Armoires, we were on tour in, in Fresno. And um, we were staying at a record store owner's house, <laughs> sleeping in, in one of these rooms. And he had a bunch of these records piled up there. And I saw this butcher cover, really poor shape, but it's, it's still, you know, it's a real thing. So I said, how much do you want for it? And he told me and I, I bought it. And so now I have one. I also have, uh, probably can't see it. It's right over my shoulder here. The autograph, a uh, Paul McCartney autograph, oh. um, which a friend of mine got. He, um, owned a restaurant here over by Disneyland and uh, actually saw Paul McCartney at some event and had him sign it. And when he sold the restaurant, he uh, gave me the, uh, gave me the autograph photo because he knew I was a big Beatles fan. So those are sort of the two crown jewels of, of my collection, but I don't go nuts. I don't have like 18 versions of rubber soul or, you know, 17 versions of uh, Sergeant Pepper or any of that kind of stuff. I don't, I don't know how people afford that. And if you do, please get in touch. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, either, either people collected this a long time ago when it didn't cost as much as it does now, or they have a lot of disposable income. Uh, it's got to be one of those. I mean, I, I have way too many records. You can't really see them all because they're down there and up here and up here. Um, and there's some stuff that I get, you know, because I, I want to pass it down to my kids. Both of them are, are Beatles fans. And, um, you know, so I, I've got, for example, a lot of, uh, a lot of red vinyl uh, Japanese albums. I love those. So, they sound and, you know, if I see them at a reasonable price, then I'll go ahead and, and pick them up. But, you know, there's, there's people who have a lot more stuff than I do. But uh, I'm, I, I'm proud of my collection. I know somebody who would probably want you to show off pieces. <laughs> so I'll get you in touch with him. But, All right. Um, like, when you're writing, like, um, when you choose things, do you just do it in, like, a Word document, or is there, like, a quote-unquote, like, vocab? app? No, I write everything. Uh, in the beginning, I write everything uh, and put it in a Word document very, very old school. And that way I can make corrections as, as I go along, and, uh, you know, red line stuff and, and edit and whatever. So yeah, I've been doing it that way since I began. 
so yeah, very, very old school in that respect. I really like your writing style. I think you like do you do you have plans for a sequel? Well, you know what? Um, I've been talking about my next book with um, the same publisher, uh, Rare Bird Records, who uh, published The Beatles 100. And if you haven't checked them out, by the way, you should, because they've published a lot of really, really great music related books. Uh, they have a few books um, dedicated strictly to uh, power pop music, one called Go All the Way and one called Go Further. And the Beatles are discussed in there. And of course, bands like, uh, bands were influenced by the Beatles, like Raspberry, Big Star, um, you know, those sorts of, of bands. So yeah, Rare Bird has a great catalog. Uh, but I've been discussing my, my next book with them and nothing's finalized yet, but uh, I'd like to do something non-Beatles related. It, it will include the Beatles, but it won't be strictly Beatles related. That's all I can really say right now, but. Uh, it'll be, uh, it'll definitely be another book about music. That's what I love to write about. And I think I'll be uh, going outside the 1960s. For this. That, that intrigues me. So um, I have to ask you, what is your favorite George Harrison album? Oh, my favorite George Harrison album. Uh Wow, that's a good question. I, that's not one I usually get asked. Um, I would say either All Things Must Pass, which everyone says, or the, uh, because there's so much great stuff on there, how can you not love it? Right. Or the, uh, or Cloud Nine. I love a lot of stuff on, on Cloud Nine. I just feel he was, he was sort of refreshed after taking that, you know, what, five or six year break uh, and had a lot of really good songs. Jeff Lynn brought out a lot of really good ideas in him and a uh, really, really cool record. So I, I'd say it's probably between those two. Would you say, um, do you remember when that came out? Like your reaction, or were you really pleased with when, it? When Cloud9 came out? Yeah. I do, yeah, it was, it was very exciting. Well, on one hand, it was very exciting because George hadn't had a record out in a long time. On the other hand, you know, the two albums he released prior to that, which I think were what, on uh, Tropo and somewhere in England? Yep. Yeah, those were okay, but they weren't great. So I was kind of wondering, well, how's this going to be? And then I heard he was working with, with Jeff Lynne and you know, a lot of people don't like Jeff Lynne's production style. He, you know, they say he makes whoever he works with sound too much like electric light orchestra, which has never been a problem for me because I love electric light orchestra. But I, I, I was a little bit worried, um, but I was also very, very excited just to hear new music from George. And then when the single Got My Mind Set On You came on the radio, I'm like, yeah, this is really cool. You know, I, I, I knew it was a cover. I knew George didn't write it, but, you know, it wasn't a cover where it was one that everybody knew. It was pretty obscure. So it was almost like it was a Harrison original for a lot of people. Um, and then just, you know, seeing all the uh, seeing all the videos that he did, which were very entertaining at the time and hearing all the album cuts. Um, I, I just grew to really, really enjoy the record. There's some you know, deeper cuts on there that don't get a lot of notice that are really cool. Like This Is Love is uh, one of my favorite tracks on, on, on that record. So I think he, he did a really great job with it. He's just so happy, and I, I really wonder if there is some unreleased material. There, there's got to be some more stuff. That... There always is, you know, um, and I wouldn't be surprised if we ended up seeing it one day. You know, there was all that unreleased material around the All Things Must Pass era that ended up coming out when they, when they reissued that, and some of that I, I wasn't even aware of and, until I actually, you know, saw it and heard it. Uh, so I'm sure there's some unreleased material floating around somewhere. Um, you know, there's still the version that I don't think has ever been officially released, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, the demo that George did of It Don't Come Easy, where it's actually him singing the lead and, <laughs> you know, the, the backing track is similar, but not the same, you know, so there's stuff out there. Yeah. When, when you write, like, do you listen 
to the music? Like if you're talking about a specific album, do you put music on? Yes, definitely. While I'm, yeah, whenever I'm writing about something, I'm listening to it at the same time because that might spark something, you know, in, in my head, like, oh yeah, that, yeah, I should write about that. Let me take a note there. So generally my, my process is, for example, if I'm reviewing an album, like coming up, I'm going to be reviewing, uh, coming up, <laughs> uh, I'm going to be reviewing a, a, um, a reissue of Wings Wildlife that's due out in about a week or so. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, it's coming out on uh, vinyl. And yeah. so, you know, I'll be listening to that while I'm writing the review. So what, my process generally when I'm writing a review, um, similar to when I'm writing books, if I'm writing about a specific song or album or collection, I'll listen to it and then I'll take notes and then I'll listen to it again and take more notes if I need to, and then sort of coalesce that into the manuscript. Uh, I'm actually in the process right now of writing a review for Goldmine uh, compilation, a box set that came out, a group called the Bo Brummels from the 60s. Oh yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah, they, their big hit was uh, Laugh, Laugh. Oh yeah. Uh, so there's a, let's see, there's an eight, eight CD box set that came out which is pretty much, for the most part, everything they've ever done, including demos and outtakes and alternate takes and, and whatever. And so, you know, listening to each one of those and taking notes, and then I'll write the review. So that's generally my process. You know, when I'm writing about the Beatles, I immerse myself in the Beatles. I'm listening to it while I'm writing about it. Now, John, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thanks, Hudson. It's uh, always great to talk to a fellow Beatles fan. And I really love what, uh, what you do. I've watched a lot of your interviews and you do a really excellent job. And, and yeah, thanks for having me and keep it up. Hopefully we'll get to chat again one day. Yes. Oh, and uh, tell us where we can buy your books and how to, the best way to contact you. Oh, well, the book is The Beatles 100. Happen to have a copy right here. And, and you happen to have a copy behind you, which I, I love, by the way. Uh, I love that screen. Uh, it's available uh, on Amazon. It's available through the Rare Bird Books website. Um, and I think it's available other retail outlets too. I think target.com and, and a bunch of different places. But uh, I would point people towards the Rare Bird website or uh, Amazon. Or if um, you know, you're, inter you're interested in getting an autographed copy directly from me. I have some here as well. So I'm all over Facebook. Uh, I have a Facebook page, John Borak Author, where you can reach out to me there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty much everywhere. And I've been really gratified uh, by the response it's received. And um, you know, looking forward, once the pandemic sort of eases up a little bit, getting out there and promoting it a little, even a little bit more, going to be going to a Beatles convention that's planned about about two months from today in late March down in San Diego, California, oh, nice. uh, which I've been to um, a couple of times over the years, several times actually over the years, to promote different books and different things. So I'll I'll be down there in March, and uh, you know looking forward to hopefully doing more signings and special events. Like, like I said, as the pandemic hopefully eases up for everyone. I think you'll come to the Metro Fest at some point. In New York. I would love to. I've been to a couple of fests. I've been to, let's see, I went to the New Jersey one when the Lennon book came out. And then uh, they had one here in LA in 2014. Oh, wow. But then they didn't have it again after that. Um, but yeah, I, I would love to go to more. You know, wherever there's Beatles fans, I, I love to go. I love to talk about the Beatles, love to listen to the Beatles, love to play the Beatles music, you know, on the drums or whatever. And yeah, it's just, it's, you know, as, as you know, it's great music that just stands the test of time and crosses so many boundaries, whether it's age or race or whatever, you know, you rarely find anyone who says, I don't like the Beatles, period. It just doesn't happen. No, it doesn't. So you can contact me if you want to. At my email address is hudson at solobeatlespodcast.com, and you can go on my website whatever. John, thank you so much again. Thank you, Hudson. It's been a pleasure.